Jerry is chairman of Standard Life, who are headquartered in Edinburgh, a vast investment company, global uh, in its reach, revenue of £9 billion. But last week, he also became chairman of Aberdeen Asset Management, another huge fund manager in Europe as the two companies merged. And that was last week. That's the pace of change, ladies and gentlemen, since I wrote this introduction. So everything that Jerry looks after, everything that he talks about, deals in these global terms. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sir Jerry Grimstone. I'll sit down here. Okay, okay. Okay. It's not altogether easy coming onto a stage <laughs> when your warm-up act has been Gordon Brown. <laughs> Normally the warm-up act builds the next speaker to a crescendo, so I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you on that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a bit about the challenges involved in running a global company from Scotland and what that might mean for Scotland in 2025. The main challenge, as we've heard already this morning, is it's impossible for any of us to predict what lies ahead. Last year wasn't a good year for experts. Adam Smith wouldn't have liked last year because pretty much every prediction that was made at the beginning of last year turned out to be wrong. And when I look back over the, last, over the last year, last couple of years, I really think that we're living in a global revolution. This isn't a global revolution as they had in Cuba where young men came in in tanks with machine guns hung over their shoulders. This is a global revolution that is playing out in, in slow time. As we heard this morning from earlier, it is the rise of populism. It is people feeling disenfranchised by politicians and frankly by business people such as myself. And the job of work we all have to do in these very uncertain times now is to settle things down. Now, who is going to survive in this ever-changing world? How are we in Scotland going to adapt? Well, I like thinking of the time when the meteor hit the earth a billion years ago and the dinosaurs became extinct. What survived then? It was the organisms which were able to adapt most rapidly to the changing circumstances at the time. And I think we are now living in an age which Darwin would have liked because it's an age where adaptation is going to mean everything. Now, of course, one of the immediate concerns for business is the UK's future relationship with the EU and what kind of access will we have to the single market from 2019 onwards. The honest answer is we know that in two years from now we will be out of the European Union. None of us know what lies ahead after that. And of course, the uncertainty that creates for all of us is, is profound. So what can we do about that? All we can do is just to prepare ourselves, think through alternatives. My company, Standard Life, as you know, we're one of the largest and oldest companies in, in Scotland. We've been in operation for 190 years. We're a truly global company. Do you know, back in the 19th century, we opened a branch in Canada before we opened a branch in England. So our roots are deeply, deeply in Scotland. A company like that, we can't change course on a sixpence. It takes us two years, three years to reorient the company if we have to move processes from here to there. We have 600,000 customers in Germany and Austria at the moment, all of whom are served out of our branches in Scotland. We have to assume we won't be able to do that going forward. So of course, ourselves and people like ourselves, we're having to start preparing already for this. We cannot wait for two years to pass by and then start preparing. And you can see against that background, and we've always been a completely apolitical company. I'm very conscious of our responsibilities, 
my responsibilities. I know that some of my you know, great colleagues think one thing politically, others think another. Some of our customers think one thing, others think another. So of course, I pick my words always very carefully. We are not a political company. Last time, three years ago, when we had to deal with the consequences of the referendum then, we never told people how to vote. I thought that is not the job of a businessman, to tell people how to vote. That's a democratic right that everybody has. But I did think it was our job to analyse the consequences of what would happen if Scotland voted for independence and to think through those consequences and to ask various questions of the government so that we can make up our mind about the consequences. So we did that, we thought about it very deeply and we asked a whole series of questions. What's the currency going to be? How are we going to be regulated? What's the monetary policy going to be? And because sadly we weren't given a single answer to any one of those questions, we had to tell people, not politically, but purely factually, that if Scotland had voted for independence, we'd have had to have moved a large part of our operations to, to England. Because the fact of standard life, as you heard from Gordon this morning, is that 90% of our employees work in Scotland. 90% of our customers come from England. We are absolutely embedded in the single market. So who knows what the future will hold? But if we have to start thinking about these things again, we will do the same thing. We won't be political, we won't be dramatic, we will just ask the same questions that we asked last time, and when we, then we will assess the answers, and then we will decide what is best for our company, our employees, our shareholders, our customers, and I guess I've got some shareholders and customers in the room today. We will try and assess what is best, what is best for them. In the, in the present world that we live in today, you can't, you can't exist in isolation. If you sit in a schoolroom in China and you look at a map of the world, every country puts itself at the centre of the map of the world. So where does the United Kingdom sit if you sit in China at the map of the world? The United Kingdom is a tiny island in the top left-hand corner of the map in the Chinese schoolroom. And the Chinese look at this with amazement. Even today, they ask themselves the same question. How did a people so far away from the center of the universe, which of course they saw as China, achieve so much? Why are these people so, so influential? Is it because they trick people? Is it because they're crafty? But we all know it's always been the ingenuity of ourselves and particularly the ingenuity of people in Scotland. Because when you think of my group of islands being in the top left hand corner, we in Scotland, we're the top bit of that top little group there. And we can't live, we can't live in, in isolation. Um, now, we have to, we run a global business from, 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 from Edinburgh. And you may have heard in the newspapers that we've announced a a proposed merger with Aberdeen Asset Management, another great Scottish company. Now, there's various takeover rules which will stop me, stop me talking about the detail about that. But what we are doing, we are creating a company whose headquarters will, global headquarters will be in Edinburgh. We're building a new great headquarters in St Andrews Square, and we are one of the very, very few global companies in Scotland which run the business from Scotland. If you go into our offices in Edinburgh, you don't see the people in the back office. You don't see the people just doing processing. Our business is run from Scotland and it's run from Edinburgh. And we're looking forward to this merged company, if it goes through, to have created the largest asset manager in the UK, the second largest asset manager in Europe, one of the largest asset managers in the world looking after the pensions and savings of 25 million people around the world, all run from Scotland. 
And I think that's a thing to be, to be proud of. But for us to do that, looking quickly ahead to 2025, what do we have to be able to do? We need people, we need access to technology, we need access to customers and clients, and we need good infrastructure. First of all, people. Ridiculously, it is now harder for us to encourage people to come to work in Scotland than it is to work in the rest of the world. If we're trying to recruit people who haven't got a base in Scotland, people who weren't, didn't go to school here, people whose families weren't here. My, my grandfather was a piper in the Black Watch. He was a Glaswegian. So I kind of qualify on, I qualify on that basis. We find it harder and harder to get people to come to Scotland. Not because it's not a great place, not because the education system isn't one of the greatest in the world, because of the uncertainty. An executive thinking about bringing his young family to Scotland at this moment in time doesn't know what the future holds. And of course, what do people do if they're faced with uncertainty? They often make decisions to go somewhere which is more, more certain. So I plead for these things to settle down, for people to know what the taxation regime is going to be like, to know how we're going to organise ourselves up here. Because for us, this isn't a, a political game. It's not a matter of posturing. For people like myself, it's how do we run these very large companies employing many, many thousands of, of people. Technology. We have to make Scotland a centre for technology. It was great to hear last night about the Kirkcaldy work that's going on in innovation. It's very important that we have sources of innovation in Scotland. Market access. As we heard Gordon say earlier, of course you couldn't run a large business from Scotland if you didn't have full access to your customers in the rest of the United Kingdom. Just wouldn't be, just wouldn't be possible. And we need good infrastructure. We need to be able to get around Scotland and we need good connectivity between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. When I think of the Northern Powerhouse, I think of Scotland. And I would like as much attention to be given to creating infrastructure between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom as we now hear being talked about in relation to cities, to cities further south. So that was a, some simple comments. It's been great to be invited here. Um, I think it's fantastic to have the Adam Smith Institute here bringing together the community in this way to discuss ideas of this sort. So thank you very much for listening to me this morning.